what God is revealing to us in this passage is we live in a world that God has not eliminated evil from. He has not eliminated yet our enemies. We're waiting for Jesus to come back and do that. And why has he not done that? To test us. To see if despite the existence of people who will disagree, despite the existence of people who will fight back, will we faithfully serve the Lord or not? This is our test. Now let's take a look at the book of 1 Thessalonians, the first epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Thessalonians. And we're going to take a look today at chapter 2, where the Lord has given to us the following. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our, in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day that we would not be a burden to any of you, we preached to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. There are particular main points I want to cover in these first 12 chapters of the first letter to the Thessalonians from the Apostle Paul in chapter 2. The first I want to make sure you are aware of is Look at, in the beginning of this chapter, the description of Paul and his company's arrival into Thessalonica and what he did despite the condition in which they arrived. This is important. We oftentimes become afraid to live outwardly the lives God wants us to live for his glory because of what people do to us. Because people disapprove, mistreat us, or our perception is they would disapprove or might mistreat us or shun us. So we hold back and don't speak the words of the Lord. Don't live an open public Christian life. He says in verse 1, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. If you don't know what that means, you'll read right over it and just move on to the next subject that you think you're going to understand next. Or you might read all 12 verses and say, I don't understand most of it. I'll just keep reading. Which would be very unfortunate. When he says that our coming to you was not in vain. What he's saying is, it was not without impact or effect, change, transformation. That's what he's saying. And he's talking about in the lives of those in Thessalonica. Verse 2, he says, But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak 
to you the gospel of God in much conflict. They had just come from Philippi where they were very badly treated, pursued by a, uh, with violence by those who wanted to stop their mouths. They had escaped Philippi and gone to Thessalonica. And when they arrived at Thessalonica, although there were those who heard the message and received, there were also a fairly large group of people that did not receive this message with joy and physically attacked them, beat them, imprisoned them. And despite this treatment, Paul says that they were bold in our God to speak to them the gospel of God in much conflict. So now here's our choice, ladies and gentlemen. Despite the fact that we will face consequences for living public Christian lives, what now shall we do? If we are to be faithful to Christ, is it okay to live quiet, private, secret Christian lives? The answer is no. It's not okay. It does not glorify God and is not pleasing in God's sight. That does not mean you need to wear a costume and bang a drum and shoot off fireworks. But leaving, living steady, public Christian lives in word and deed is not optional for the children of God if they are to remain a part of the children of God. Despite the conflict that we face. Now... Paul was coming with a message that they had not heard before. That's why he uses the word preach the gospel. You see, to preach the gospel means to announce it. Announce it to people who have not heard it before. That's what preaching is. Once somebody's heard the gospel, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to respond favorably or disfavorably. Those who respond favorably can now be taught can now be made into disciples, teaching them to, as the Lord Jesus said before he ascended, to do the things the Lord's commanded them to do. Or as we see at the end of this verse 12, that people would learn to walk worthy of God who calls us into his own kingdom and glory. To walk worthy of God means to humble ourselves before him, listen to him, learn from him, and be doers of his will. That's what it means to walk worthy of the calling or invitation that God has given to us for his own kingdom and glory, by the way. Now he says, we, or for our exhortation, verse three, did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Why would he have to say something like that except that there are many who travel around in the name of Jesus who are coming from error, coming from uncleanness, or are deceptive? We have been warned by the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit that people are going to sneak in among us and be servants of the devil instead of the Lord, making all sorts of claims distracting us from the truth, tempting us to depart from the purity of the word of God and to walk according to what is right in our own eyes. Verse four, he says, but we, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. I'm going to get to this part about testing our hearts here toward the end, but right now I want you to focus on what does it mean for God to approve of someone and entrust someone with something, in this case, the gospel. To approve means have proven, purified, tested, and found faithful and righteous and holy before God. That's what it means. It's not an arbitrary appointment that God gives to people to do this. 
And this is not a God discovering whether or not we're going to be holy, whether we're going to be righteous, and whether we're going to be faithful. This is us discovering whether we're going to be those things. And if we are those things, we can know that God will appoint us into his service. But if we're not, we shouldn't wonder why he's not appointing us into that service. Because the answer is obvious. Because we're not approved by God. So he won't entrust us with such responsibilities. Then there are people who go out then and try to counterfeit such approval and such entrustment, even in the name of Jesus. And they are ministers of the devil instead of the Lord Jesus. And they end up working for the devil and taking people away from Christ instead of toward him, in him, to grow in wisdom, knowledge, grace, and favor with him. As we look to the charge that God gives to us, whether we are preachers of the gospel, makers of disciples, husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, influencers in our community, in our neighborhood, maybe even in small groups in certain settings, including those who are in prison and they would be inmates in, this, in the prison. There's groups in these prisons. How will you conduct yourself? Will it be as men pleasers or pleasing to God? What will you choose? Knowing that God is testing your heart by this very thing. Yes, it is true. God tests your heart. Not so he can find out whose you are, but so you will know. We're going to get to that subject here in just a bit. Verse 5, he, five, he says, For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is a witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. There are lots of folks out there speaking with flattering words. How will you know whether to listen to them or not? How will you know whether they are flattery or truth? Unless you know the word of God. If you don't know the truth, you are an easy target to be deceived. It's very simple to deceive someone that does not know the truth. There are others who do this work as a cloak for covetousness, a pretext for greed. I had somebody ask me last week uh, what I thought about a particular person who has a so-called Christian ministry. And when I investigated this person, didn't take me long that this person has become worth personally more than a hundred million dollars out of his so-called ministry. That's a dead giveaway for somebody who's doing this for a cloak for covetousness, a pretext for greed. Everywhere in the scriptures, this would be very clear that it's not somebody who is rich that is the problem but getting rich off of ministerial work that is supposed to be for the Lord is a dead giveaway as to somebody who is doing this as a cloak for covetousness. It's not a question. It's not a debate. It's obvious. <clears throat> he says, nor did we seek glory from men. Look, when you are a genuine minister of God, approved by God, entrusted by God, with the gift of God that he wants you to impart to the target audience that he has designed for you to do, and he has entrusted this unto you for his glory, you don't do it to please other people. You are hopeful they will learn. You are hopeful they will listen. And you will, are hopeful they will follow the Lord Jesus. But that, they're not the primary object. The primary object is the one who sent you and that you are serving. And it is for his glory that you do this, 
and you're going to report back to him to find out if you were pleasing, not the people. Let's not forget that the reason Jesus was put to death, to death was because he was more interested in pleasing his Father in heaven at all times than he was in pleasing the people. And for that, he was killed. This is very clear, very well recorded. But we should be, in fact, attending to others with the kind of care that God describes here. There's a gentleness. There's a, an affection. There is a manner in which we treat people. Look, Paul and his company could have said, hey, look, as apostles of Jesus Christ, we're coming to minister to you and you should be giving us a place to live and food to eat and caring for our needs while we're here. Instead, you know what he did? He worked making tents. He worked with his own hands by day and ministered to them by night so that he would not be a burden to them so that they would not have to bear the responsibility of caring for him because he wanted them to make sure that they were very clear that he was bringing something to them, not coming to take something from them. And thus, that is why the ministry work that we do is modeled after this very thing. We work. The Lord provides for us. And in the time outside of our vocational work, we do the extra work and ministry that we can do on nights and on weekends, just as Paul was doing and his group was doing. Because I don't want anybody to come to me or our team and say, you're only doing this because you get paid. And I don't ever want to be in a position of being, having to compromise because I'm afraid of what might happen if I say something or do something the Lord wants me to say or do, and people might leave and the money might go with them. When you impart that which God has entrusted to you to impart to others, you not only impart to those people his words of truth, but his character lived out in your life. He describes this. He says, for you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preached to you the gospel of God. And what was their character? So that's what they did to work. And bringing to them the truth of the gospel. But he also describes, and you are witnesses in God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Think about this in your ministerial work. First of all, if you're a husband or a wife, you have ministerial work. Automatically. If you are in a church where you have taken some kind of an office, you have ministerial work. If you are in a job where you have a managerial or leadership position, you have ministerial work. If you are in any group or organization that you're participating in or cooperating in, you have ministerial work to do charged to you by God to see how you will conduct yourself. And if you will be faithful to God or not, for this is the way he tests your hearts. And he wants everyone to conduct themselves devoutly, justly, and blamelessly. This is a huge problem for the crowd that says no one's perfect because these three words don't comport with people who say no one's perfect and they're okay with continuing to walk in their, in their sin. These three words are a description of people who are absolutely diligent, highly attentive to make sure that their lives are pure, holy in God's sight, just among all people with no partiality, toward or against anyone and without sin in their life, because that's what blamelessly means. They're very intentional. That's what this description is. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to a give them the message that this is what God is seeking in his children. 
and he showed them that it was possible. That's why. So that they would be without excuse. So let's take a look now what God means by testing our hearts as we see in verse 4. You see, all of this is true and God gives what we've just talked about in his word right here before us. We can't give them the yeah, buts, but, 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 and expect it to fly. The question is, how should we respond? How should we now live? Well, God says that he is the tester of our hearts. How does he do this? Would it be a test if I was to ask my grandkids who love ice cream? Would it be a test if I said, hey, kids, why don't you come with me to the ice cream store? That wouldn't be much of a test, would it? It has nothing but an upside for them, and there's no conflict or consequence for them. So what does it mean for God to test our hearts? Well, I'm going to draw your attention to Judges chapter 2 as we go backwards in our Bibles. After the book of Joshua and before the first book of Samuel, Judges chapter 2. And this is a description of a time after the death of Joshua that the hearts of the people of Israel turned away from God. Now, here's something to remember. I'm going to help you see the parallel, hopefully, here. The word translated Joshua in the Old Testament is the same as we translate Jesus in the New Testament. After the death of Joshua in chapter 2, we learn about Israel turning away from God to serve false gods and walk according to the lust of their own flesh and doing what was right in their own eyes. And God tells us, starting in verse 11, says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. This is after the death of Joshua. And this is after the generation that followed Joshua faithfully had passed on, which is the people who were leading people to walk in righteousness, but the people started fading away. They started joining in with the idolic worship in the community and in their, in their country area. And verse 11 says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. But those names could be anything else we would serve. Verse 14, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity as the Lord, for calamity as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass, listen to this next part now, and it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded the, their fathers and has not heeded my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. You want to answer as to why evil exists? You're going to discover right now. So that through them I may test Israel whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. 
Therefore, the, le the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the wars of Canaan. This was only so that the generation of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it, namely five lords of Phil the Philistines and the Hivites who dwelt in, the, in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. You see, what God is revealing to us in this passage is we live in a world that God has not eliminated evil from. He has not eliminated yet our enemies. We're waiting for Jesus to come back and do that. And why has he not done that? To test us. To see if despite the existence of people who will disagree, despite the existence of people who will fight back, will we faithfully serve the Lord or not? This is our test. This is how God tests our hearts. And we've been entrusted with lives that are intended to glorify him as we live them out openly and publicly. The question now is, what shall we do? Will we pass the test or not? Did you know God tests your hearts this way? Are you aware that God puts people into your life without taking away all the people who are going to disagree with your Christian walk for the purpose of testing you. You see, God could get rid of everybody who doesn't walk with him right now. Be that simple. Wouldn't be difficult. Now you know why he doesn't. It's not just about teaching us. It is about testing us because God is trying to show us what is genuine in our hearts. See, people with pretext and pretense say all sorts of things. And people have been led to believe by lots of false teachers that they are safe in the hands of God. The problem is God speaks to us very clearly and he provides the circumstances to test us. When I was younger, one of the big problems I have is I could not understand this concept because nobody had ever explained this to me. I had to learn this by abiding in Christ faithfully and listening to the word of the Lord. And my mentor many years ago helped me understand this. It's very, because I struggled with why do evil people continue to somehow prosper and what looks like good people suffer? That made no sense to me. If God was so loving and so righteous, why does he let that happen? And that's the essence of the sense of the test. You see, people frequently struggle with the fact that they have to experience headwinds, pushback, confrontation, persecution, suffering. And when they do, they crawl back in their hole. They are not bold. They are not courageous. They are not willing to stay in the battle, armed with the armor of God, and crush the head of the enemy under their feet. They retreat. Yes, and so the, the, the argument is, but God already knows that, so why is he putting us to the test? Not for God, it's for us. God doesn't need to learn anything. What he's exposing to us is the truth. People walk around frequently thinking they're in good condition with God. So what does God do? Puts a test before them. Thank you for joining us today on our YouTube channel, XL for Christ. We hope you like and even subscribe to our YouTube channel for ongoing edification that you can gain from listening to the messages and hopefully diving further into the Word of God to find out His truth. We also like you to visit our website at xlforchrist.org. This website talks about the discipleship process that we engage in with folks to help them grow in Christ. We hope you will join us in our endeavor to make disciples for the glory of God.